Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the uh, Board of Selectmen for the Town of Situate. We've gone into executive session, and we actually just returned about uh, five minutes ago. Um, we were waiting for our uh, television to come on live because uh, now we're being televised. Um, I'd like to uh, move on to agenda item number four, which happens to be at 7 o'clock p.m. Let's call it 7.05. Resume, resume into the regular session. And as a part of that, it's a walk-in period. Are there any walk-ins at this time? Please. Yeah, I need you to state your name. If you could sit here at the, uh, the uh, desk, state your name and your address, please. My name is Mary Jenkins, and I live at 22 Sunset Road. I'm a member of the uh, newly formed Situate Coastal Coalition and the president of the First Cliff Association. The packets um, you're getting uh, contain a petition, photos, and a newspaper article pertaining to the seawall situation out on First Cliff. The black and white photos were from the 1930s, late 1930s. If I could just interrupt you there for one moment, uh, Ms. Jenkins. Um, is this pertaining to the seawall on Ed Edward Foster Road? Yes. Okay. We're going to be having an agenda item on this um, actually um, at number six. Um, okay. I have to tell you right now, we can take a look at this packet and we could have you give a five minute discussion, a discussion of what and then right after there. that we're done. There's no but discussion because uh, of the open meeting laws. Or if you want, we can wait until agenda item six and you can raise it at that point. Um, you want me to just give you a brief description and revisit it at item six? Well, so we're going to be talking about the um, no? storm no. update and of, I assume this relates to the storm right. issue. So I guess the question I have for you is, you can give a brief five minute discussion on it. We can't talk about it. But if we talk about it under agenda item number six, which is the update and the storm, then we can address the issue there. Okay. So, so we'll I guess the, the question. Packets, you got them, and we'll talk about it at six. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other walk ins? Okay. Um, moving on to agenda item number five, I'd like to have a discussion vote on the movie and common vicular license for South Shore Cinemas LLC, One Mill Wharf Plaza. And if you could state your name, please, and and do you live here in town, or do you represent the? Um, I represent South Shore Cinemas. Okay, and ultimately, what are you looking to do? Switch your, you're taking we over the cinema. Transfer, yeah, we're just taking over operation of the. We're going to call it the Mill Wharf Cinema. Um, was under Patriot Cinemas, and my husband used to own the old one, you know, as the Playhouse. So we're just coming back, and we just want to transfer the license. Um, to operate a movie theater in the common vitriol license. So that'll be effective as of the time that we, right now you don't control it or you, you, you're well running. Well we do because we were, um, we could operate under their license. They already okay. renewed so we're just asking for the transfer. On January 1st we took over. Okay. Questions from the board? Just mo oh, just a quick question. Did you, did you purchase it from them? Is that what happened? No, they left and we purchased the equipment. The equipment? Yes. Okay. Who's Wait. they? Patriot left? Patriot Cinemas left. They, they leased it. Patriot yeah. Cinemas from yeah. the uh, owner, the association, and so they've taken on the lease and you bought the equipment that's okay. there. And you intend to keep it a movie theater for? As long as people come. Good. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're obligated under the condo docs that they have to have a movie theater there, or some kind of cinema, or some something theatrical. Like that. Okay. Excellent. Motion, Mr. Chairman? Please. <coughs> Will the Board of Selectmen vote to grant a movie license and common Vic license to South Shore Cinemas? LLC 1 Milwaukee Plaza. Second. Seconded by Ty, Mr. Harris by seniority. Uh, discussion? <laughs> uh, seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Uh, uh, aye. It's unanimous. Thank you very much and good luck. We look good forward luck. to having you in town. Yeah. Again. Uh, moving on to agenda item number six. It's an update on the storm from the December 26th and 27th and um, 2010. And, um, Tricia, I, I know that there are a few issues that we want to address. One was the um, community response to the storm. Um, obviously, you know, we want to kind of recognize certain people for that, Chief um, Judge, Chief um, Stewart, as well as um, Mike Breen and, and other people. <coughs> I'd like to at least kind of turn it over to you for a moment. Sure. Um, if I could just set up each of the bullet items that you have under storm update and then turn it over to the board for any questions. But right now, if Chief Judge, Chief Stewart, and Mike Breen could come um, sit up here. Gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. You guys had a heck of a week, to put it uh, <laughs> Who 
for an excellent job. So thank you. Um, so what I'd like to talk a little bit, I mean, most people have seen the stuff on TV and um, sort of the situation that the town went through for about 36 hours between the um, evening of Sunday, uh, December 26th, all the way through Tuesday. Um, and, you know, I, I've extended my thanks and I want to do it publicly to the public safety departments and the chiefs as their representatives, as well as Mike Brain and the DPW. Um, you know, we can be very proud as a community that there were no lives lost and, um, you know, it just shows that that money we spend for training and investing in our personnel really pays off when push comes to shove. Um, in any disaster, I think there are untold stories of people's compassion. So in addition to these guys, I just want the board to particularly note um, that George Cook and Bruce Johnston, Jr. were the two gentlemen driving the big loader that evacuated over 30 people from those houses. Our loader is shot, but those people are safe, and I want to particularly commend them. Um, I want to particularly know, um, and I realize there's many stories, but for the board's edification, Nicole Harris, who is a building uh, clerk in the building department, our zoning officer, was one of the first evacuees we took out uh, Sunday night. And Nicole came in Monday when we were closed to check the answering machine in building to make sure people didn't have questions and needed help. Um, and I want to particularly um, note that. Deputy Murphy, Deputy Chief Murphy, I know was out with the chiefs and the staff, um, and I want to commend him. Rick Sullivan, who's going to be the new cabinet secretary for um, environmental affairs, provided two heavy equipment loaders and their operators to us after he visited the sites from DCR. We're very grateful. And uh, personally, and I know on behalf of the board, we can't thank Representative Jim Cantwell enough, who is actually here all day Monday trying to get someone for National Grid here, along with Mr. Dennehy. So um, those are just a few. I know there are many more. Um, and the acts of selflessness from people in the community to help the folks that have, have lost their stuff. Um, but in terms of the chiefs and, and the DPW, um, I know that they did not go to sleep and they worked straight. They responded to calls just like the line officers. And um, I think we can all be very, very proud of <coughs> Thank you. Did either anybody want to add anything? I mean, pat yourselves on the back, but I mean, seriously, <coughs> you really should because um, I certainly saw, the board saw what was done by each one of you. And, you know, um, first we had a snowstorm, but in the midst of that, uh, a blizzard that had dramatic effect at, um, on our town. And um, um, thank gosh, nobody was injured as a result of that and it's due to everybody's effort and I have to say even with the um, um, between the, the police officers trying to make sure with down wires and trying to make sure directing traffic to the firefighters who literally put themselves in harm's way not knowing whether or not the water was electrified because the wires they weren't sure whether or not it had been turned off it's phenomenal and and like I say with uh, Bruce Johnson and George Cook for you know, literally, people don't realize in order to remove and extract people from these areas, they go in into the deep water. People get into the buckets because that's the only way you can kind of get them out of there. You can't put them into a boat and, and go around, and they're going through all this in the dead of night at 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning, 3, 4, when the big waves are coming over. Um, you know, it's just phenomenal. So um, I just uh, on behalf of the board, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Joe. Just one, Questions? one other quick comment. You know, saw it firsthand, you know, the great work that all you guys did. You know, Chief, you look like you were going to you were walking uh, wounded there for a while and did great getting the, the shelter set up and getting those people an opportunity to stay somewhere. Um, a lot of people don't understand, you know, the impact that this is having on a lot of families in situate. And there are a lot of relief organizations or groups getting together right now if people watching TV um, want to participate in this. I know that um, Dance Carousel and Jenkins School and I don't know if, uh, if, if the police or fire are setting up things where if you have um, clothing or funds or um, any sorts of things that can help these people who are really displaced for several weeks or months um, to help them get through this time period that, that there are opportunities for you to give, um, donate your stuff to these places. So again, if you want to contact either the Jenkins School, because I think it was mostly in that district, and Dance Carousel as another one that I know is collecting um, goods for these families. 
I don't know if you... Okay, put a plug in. There is going to be a fundraiser at the Barker Tavern on January 15th. It's going to be a comedy night. So the, the, the money is... The funds are going to benefit the, uh, the displaced people. Good. That's great. Uh, I was hoping for that. No, absolutely. I mean, that's, I think the community response is phenomenal because there are a lot of stories of people who are displaced and people calling and saying, I've got a place, you can stay in it immediately. Some of these, some families, I know some of the uh, people who were affected by the fire were able to, some people were affected immediately by the wall. Other people in mind just say, hey, look, I'm going to be away, go ahead and stay. It's just, it's amazing. I was here and I think it was, uh, I, I remember getting a phone call at 10 o'clock in the morning from somebody in Community Christmas saying, where can we donate right away? The conf fire was just under control, and they were calling to try to figure out what they could do, you know, and of course, you know, between you, your wife, Elena, um, with the shelter, you know, this is Chief Judge's wife, um, you know, just your family was committed to this day and night for 48 hours plus, and uh, just they phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, well, your daughter recruited. <laughs> but I have to say, it's just that's you know, it's phenomenal the the out, outpouring, and, and you know, this doesn't end here. The impact is going to be pervasive for the next months, um, and um, so it's just it's great. It's great to live in this town, seeing that type of response. You're only as good as the sum of your parts. I, we clearly have a lot of good parts, so we should be proud. Um, good. Anything else, Tricia, we had? Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please pass that on to us. Thank you again. Okay, Neil, you're next. Mr. Duggan, I hear you've been up and about, over, around, That's in and correct. out. Kevin, don't, can you come up too? So should I move to the next bullet? Mr. Please. The next please. Uh, bullet is um, the structural and building assessment update with um, Neil and Kevin Cafferty, who's a town engineer. Um, specifically, I want to highlight three things and let um, Neil and Kevin um, sort of elaborate, because um, I don't pretend to have all the details. I have a lot. But um, the temporary patch on the seawall was completed, I believe, today. Um, we had excellent response from the contractor who left another job to come to us, our aid, right mm -hmm. away. Um, he had d done the seawall uh, remediation in Marshfield and has had a lot of experience in seawalls and we're very grateful to Mr. Lynch and his staff to do that. Uh, the cost of that temporary patch is about over $40,000. We haven't got the, um, the um, final cost yet, um, but... Um, I think it's important to reassure people, and Kevin just can speak to this in a bit, that it's a solid patch and people do not need to be worried. We actually did a little additional more stuff uh, in the field yesterday when we were out there to ensure that. The lighthouse has about $30,000 worth of damage. It needs the entire shed replaced. Um, we're working on arranging quotes and for that work. Um, and Dave Ball's been working with Kevin on trying to get that work done. I had a question on that, and, and only because I've been going by it every, almost every day. Um, is that shed, that structural, uh, historically significant? Um, I know I asked that because I was thinking, I know that obviously the, the corridor is, the house is, the, the, the actual tour is, but I was curious whether or not is that, what was that function? Because I see it's, it's damaged, I see the side of it. Is it something that the was... utility shed, Kevin? Is it something that is um, necessary? Yeah, that's I don't know. I, I, I should have asked him yesterday when I saw him, but I was just curious because if it's not, is it necessary? Do you need it? Right, but right. Anyway. I, I know it has an important function, John, and it's escaping sure. me right now. Um, and finally, the last thing, um, and just to follow up on the email that I sent to the board today, um, Neil has um, been working I, We have sort of the storms in phases, which is the emergency response and rescue and the sheltering and taking care of the folks that were displaced. Now we're into the remediation phase, but part of that is determining just how great and extensive the damage is. And a big part of that is structural damage to homes, ensuring that folks who are back in their homes or have been in their homes are safe. And what became very apparent um, over the last few days is that um, we have a number of houses that need to be seen inside and out to ensure that our residents are safe. Um, over 400 homes um, will probably be looked at in the course or the past several days are going forward. Today um, we had over a dozen inspectors plumbing wiring from the town that Neil has deputized and building inspectors along with 
um, the Department of Public Safety um, with a command center from the Plymouth County Sheriff's Office. They completed Oceanside, Turner, Lighthouse, Rebecca, Surfside, and Seagate roads today. Tomorrow they will be in town doing the number <coughs> avenues from 1st to 11th, and then we will do Humrock later in the week. Um, we found a number of houses today we had to do an additional electrical shutoffs to because there was a hazard. Um, Neil has done an unbelievable job of getting things in place and um, segregating out different routes for the inspectors to look at. So those are the three things I wanted to bring up, but you know, give you an opportunity. And Neil, I think you can talk a little bit more about what's going on um, it, relative to what he and Kevin are doing. Yeah, uh, basically um, we started Monday morning um, early after the storm and um, I uh, called in uh, several people and I was uh, certainly aware that uh, there was damage along the coast and I had uh, a person do a preliminary damage assessment in Hammerock, uh, Oceanside Drive, Turner Road, all, all the hot spots, Eater Point. So by the middle of the week we pretty much had, uh, we had a good idea of what sort of damage uh, we had. Um, the, the problem um, that we face uh, in, in any assessment uh, is that so many of these homes are, are not occupied and you just can't get inside. So you have to make a lot of assumptions. In years past, National Grid has been uh, a lot more proactive and um, they've gone around and uh, they'll, they'll pull meters off of houses that I, you know, they just pull them and leave a notice and, um, you, you know, and. and it's, just, it's a double-edged sword because, you know, if you put somebody's power out and their house freezes up and the toilets break and, the, you know, they get more damage inside than they would have. So, you know, it's, it's a, um, it's a, it creates a bit of a dilemma. So uh, today when we went out, we had, you know, National Grid, you know, has rallied the forces and they're really, you know, helping us. They're, they're there with us now. Uh, we were looking for the severely damaged houses that um, were, uh, you know, had already been broke, breached by the ocean, you know, first floor, second floor, so there's really not much more you can do to hurt them. And, and we found four that we shot down, and a, a fairly good number of others where we posted them and uh, we're waiting for the owners, uh, you know, to get in touch with us. Um, Could I just interrupt you there? Neil, you know, sure. what's, what's the, you know, by shutting them down, what's the, um, um, if you don't, what's the, the, the inherent hazard that could could happen so people could understand why we're looking uh, to do just what you're doing. Anything from, you know, shock to, uh, <coughs> you know, fire, you know, shot circuiting. And uh, just, just to give you, I want to give an example. I'm going to use Nicole, my secretary. Uh, she was evacuated at 3 o'clock in the morning. Her electric panel was uh, underwater completely. Uh, this was her furnace and her hot water heater. Um, the gas was coming up into the house, and that's what, you know, what got them up and why they called 911. Um, the three days after that, um, we took medicine into our own hands, of course, and we took, we popped the meter off. Three, four, five days after that, uh, you know, in all up and down the avenues, there's just been no proactive response uh, from National uh, Grid. And, and we've since had meetings with them, and we're, we're trying to work it out, but it, this really needs to be addressed um, down the road. Um, the, uh, back in 1991, they drove around in trucks with deputy inspectors, and they made decisions on the spot, and, uh, you know, things took place, and it didn't take two weeks, so. Uh, so the, so harm that, know, the harm that we're looking at is, yes, uh, they could disconnect the electrical, which could cause burst pipes and toilet issues and water and damage interior, but the greater harm could be that if there's some kind of electrical malfunction, since the electrical oh, box could yeah. have been covered by salt water, deterioration of the wires, sparking a fire yep. and then yep. boom not only is the house lost but also the houses right, next to them exactly. so we're so so you know in, in just going back to 91 and I, I was also here in 1978 i was living on lighthouse road uh, they shut down whole sections of the town they just shut off your gas your water everything uh so there, there comes a point where you have to do that you know and say you know whatever suffer the consequences but you know we've had a little time to look at places and there's a lot of workmen out there so we can get into places so you know we're making I, I think is it's, it's working out well okay. right now but uh, that, that was the biggest challenge you know frankly of the whole thing and I just want to thank first of all, all my inspectors all the and I can't even name them all, all the, uh, the the guys we call last night uh, electricians in town 
you know, can you come in tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock? The Department of Public Safety came down. They wanted four inspectors, all right? Well, I only had one available inspector. Uh, we, we got four electricians right away come in, showed up. You know, they, 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 they're making a heck of a lot more money, uh, you know, working, and they give, they give basically, you know, they're, you know, they're, uh, they're sacrificing for the town. These are all guys that live in the town. I also want to thank the fire department and the police department. Um, we received numerous compliments from the Department of Public Safety as to how, how well the uh, town, the building inspector's office, the police and the fire get along. And I just want to thank you for their cooperation because um, they had several police officers, the fire was there, the police chief, the fire chief, and um, that's not always the case in other towns. So um, I really want to thank them and also Patricia for all her support. And of course my secretary, Nicole, right. has been great through the whole thing. And um, Kevin had arranged um, to have the seawall situation addressed immediately. And Kevin, can you talk a little bit about how we've done that patch and also the seawall inspections that are going on now throughout the town? Um, basically what we did is we hired a contractor who had prior experience in town. He did the small FEMA seawall job with us earlier in the year, um, which was a $100,000 job for miscellaneous seawall work in Humrock, um, off Surfside, and um, the location um, right up by Peggotty Beach, that little rock area there. Um, he responded. One of the things that we did is where the wall breached, um, we pushed the concrete out and we built it up with stone and we built the mass of stone there so that it would act. It's actually probably going to be stronger than the <coughs> wall with, with the mass of stone that's there right now. <coughs> um, we also had the contractor go out on the beach um, and push a lot of the stones that were out there that were all pulled back from the seawall right up against the seawall back to the location where they should be. And what that does, it diverts some of the power when the wave hits a wall. It hits a stone and it breaks up some of the power that's impacted on the wall itself. So he went up and down the beach. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, it's probably 300 feet in each direction at least, pushing the stones up and trying <coughs> to stabilize that area. Um, <coughs> you know, we went over with conservation. Conservation didn't have any problems. It was an emergency, you know. Um, so it worked out, it worked out really well. Um, and I, I think overall that area is probably stronger. The wall that did break was rated a B. Um, that wall did its job. I think that's where the brunt of the storm came and hit in that one direction. If we had a D-rated section of wall there, we might have lost hundreds of feet of wall. Um, but it, it was a it was a good section of wall that took the took the mass of that storm. So in in, in that regard, we were lucky. Yeah, the one thing that I, I gleaned from I think it was um, Lieutenant Murphy, or at some point was that. Unlike the no-name storm where you had like repeated tides coming in, this was just one tide <coughs> at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Wham, hit that wall and then took it out. Um, and, and we were fortunate we didn't have t successive days or tides that, that impacted it, which uh, was amazing. It's an amazing tide that did this impact. So, um, And uh, you're right, that's a B wall, which we have a, a book, I forgot what, it's a report that we've been, uh, the DPW's been doing. It's been collecting information and, and recently, um, um, uh, has been upgrading all the data on that, correct? That's something we plan on doing. Is doing it's it's a couple years old. The survey that we had, um, and it was done by Vine Associates, which is a uh, a very good uh, coastal contractor. It does a, a lot of evaluations, and they're the ones that evaluate that wall as a B. So, questions at all from the board? Just a just a quick comment, following up on on your point, John is that, uh, you know, unfortunately, this storm wasn't that unusual. I mean, there was a four or five day period ahead of time where the fetch and the wind was able to build up and then that final tide came and was the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were. But, you know, I hope this storm is a famous one for us, like we refer to 78 and 91 or the Halloween storm. I hope we refer to the Christmas 2010 storm, but unfortunately, I don't think we're going to because these sorts of storms are not that unusual. And, uh, you know, if it had been a longer storm, then the damage would have been worse. And if it had been a D wall 
or even a seawall or whatever it might be, then the damage would have been worse as well. So the immediate question, obviously, that we're discussing here is, is, a, is a debrief and, and how to deal with the immediate situation. But we're certainly going to have to, as a town, deal with things much greater in the future looking forward as sea level continues to rise and storm frequency continues to increase as, uh, as everyone's predicting that they are going to be. But I just want to have everybody remember that this damage is something that we're going to remember. And the damage was quite large and obviously horrific for many individuals. Um, but unfortunately, the storm itself, this wasn't a big hurricane. This wasn't a big, huge, huge storm that is, that's going to go down in the annals of the history of New England. It's just a regular storm. Anything else, gentlemen, you'd like to add other than, um, I again, commend you both. I saw you both, you were both up earlier. You came to, came to deal with these issues and just can't thank you enough for it. Um, people, I, I say that because te people in town don't realize that, you know, your hard work and the efforts, and it's not just your hard work, it's like the, the people who deny, decide to donate their time, as you say, Mr. Duggan, you know, just to, to give back to the town. It's the cooperative nature that makes this town so so nice yeah it's really impressive they really they're, they're so willing to come out and help and these, and, these are citizens and it's funny because we had a fire <laughs> the day after the storm and it turned out that the person who was one of the it burned down one of their buildings the point i'm raising is that this person was out trying to shovel and break down all the uh, uh the sand and, and take care of it you know and um it's unfortunate for, for yeah. that family but you know they they they're giving at the time, and then they have a tragedy themselves. So, right. but nobody was injured, thank heavens. So, Mr. Norton, I'm just wondering, Mr. Chairman, if, if, if this might be the time to deal with the large seawall issue now that we get Kevin here, uh, or do you want to go on to? Yeah, no, that that would be fine. Why don't we do that then? And and if you if if you don't mind, gentlemen, I, I know that um, uh, Ms. Uh, Jenkins had raised an issue during walk-in. I think at this point, if you don't mind, just. To, Stepping back, can and I, then can I ask that we go through the planned agenda with due respect, Joe? Because okay. I really Fine. want to paint nope. the full picture of what the town is facing. Okay. Right All right. All right. So that that makes sense. Yep. I'll hold on then. Um, Appreciate it, gentlemen. Then, if you don't mind hanging, sticking around a little bit, then right. we're going to move on to the next issue, which is the MEMA FEMA process and potential uh, eligibility. Then, um, obviously, once the storm ended, we started getting phone calls about MEMA and FEMA reimbursement. I think um, the board was out in force right away looking to see what relief we could have for the, not only the seawall but for the storm cleanup. Um, some of this will be, the board has heard before, but again, for folks watching at home um, and people here, I want to sort of go through the MEMA-FEMA process because it's rather complex. Uh, in order for the town to get any funds for any of the storm damage, including the seawall breaches, um, breach, is we need to have, there's a county threshold that needs to be met and a statewide threshold that needs to be met. Both those thresholds need to be met before the governor can ask the president for a federal declaration. So all of Plymouth County has a number that they have to hit and there's, there's a statewide number that has to be hit. So what we're doing and Neil is doing with all the stuff that he's compiling for the structural damages is we're compiling <coughs> those damage reports and those cost estimates. Those went out to all the emergency management directors in the state um, last Friday. There's three um, areas of MEMA assistance. One is for public assistance, two communities for repair of infrastructure, like the seawall breach we owned, like the water main break on Lighthouse Road that happened amidst all that. So for the town zone and the town zone cleanup relative to that. The second one is for individual assistance to homeowners who experience flooding and other structural damage to their homes. Flooding in a basement is not MEMA eligible unless it's living space. A secondary home or a cottage is not MEMA eligible. So when Neil goes through all his reports and we put our total requests into MEMA, those are the types of things that need to be looked at. The third area is snow assistance. And a lot of other communities in Plymouth County had a lot of snowfall. So all that gets compiled by MEMA, <coughs> they tally it up, and then they look at the statewide total. Um, but for disaster assistance in the county alone, there has to be over 100 homes that have been struck, and 100 homes and or businesses that have been structurally impaired such that we do it. In speaking to Neil, he thinks we'll probably hit the county total all by ourselves. 
Um, but um, again, that information is still in the gathering stage. Uh, we're looking at over a million dollars total damage for the county, over eight million for the state. So we have to wait till all those other communities report. MEMA officials will be here on Thursday. They've been here throughout the week. Um, they're mostly particularly going to be looking at some work we have from 07 on seawalls that needs to be done. FEMA officials will be here on Friday. Um, so again, I'll, this work will be ongoing for many, many months. Um, the purpose of the state and federal officials <coughs> visiting last week from State Senator Headland to Representative Cantwell to <coughs> Congressman-elect Keating to Senator Brown. We've made those various appeals, but that answer has always been essentially what I just told the board, that there's certain thresholds <coughs> to be made, and they're working very hard and very diligently to do that. But all of those funds come to the town, even if they are deemed eligible, on a reimbursable basis, which means the town must front the money and get reimbursed at some point later in the future. Um, so, so that's what we're facing right now. Rick? Okay. So we have these costs that we're incurring over the next days, weeks, months. And if we hit the threshold, eventually perhaps we'll get reimbursed because just hitting the threshold doesn't mean a declaration will come. Is that correct? Say the county hits its threshold, the state hits its threshold, the governor makes a request to the president, right. the president will say yes or no? Hopefully grants it, but... But they might say no. Seawalls are not FEMA eligible. Okay, seawalls are not FEMA eligible. All right, so back to the other point then. They used to be. They're not anymore. What if we don't, if, so we're making these expenditures a week or a month. What if we don't hit or we don't get the aid? Then the town of Situate is responsible for all the bills it is incurring right now. And so we don't know that for a long period of time. Well, we have to we're pay these still out responsible now. for paying all these bills because federal, like, and seawall right. repair, and Kevin can tell you, is a long and arduous process to yep. go through, and that's why we still have an 07 project ready yep. to pull the trigger okay. on. Okay, got it. Keep in mind that seawall project from 07 that was repaired was actually identified 10 years earlier in 1997. It took 10 years to repair that yeah. section of the wall. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. And the issue with the 07 money is it was available, then got frozen, then got unfrozen. We have to set up contracts, put out to bid, arrange contractors, and the town fronts that money and then gets reimbursed. We have to know, be notified that the funds have been sort of uh, set aside for us. Then we go and do it. There's partial payments that are available, and that's what we're going to be talking about with MEMA on Thursday. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's our dime, and then at some point, God willing, you know, we might get a reimbursement. Okay. But it's all very much uh, um, a big dime. Um, it's a, a very <coughs> moving process right now, changing process. Um, so, so I just wanted to update that, and then I guess we can just segue into the next item, John, which is um, the payment of costs. Do you want me to do that? Please. Yep. So. Folks keep asking the town and contacting our office to find out, you know, what the storm damage cost is, and we've sort of said this nebulous millions of dollars right now. We, you know, we're working on itemizing the cost for what the DPW response was, what the public safety response was when all of our firefighters and all of our police officers were out. All of those folks were kept overtime for several hours. Those costs all need to be segregated out and itemized. The equipment, the contractors, we've had 12 contractors working in town since um, Monday afternoon or Tuesday, not only here in the uh, Oceanside area and Surfside, which they've done a tremendous job cleaning up. Hamarok area has private contractors cleaning that out, but we're going to be doing work in Hamarok later this week with the inspections. We do know that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, one of the loaders in the DPW we had severe salt uh, exposure and don't anticipate that to last more than another year. The pumper that's on the capital, my recommendations for capital for FY12 um, is dead. Um, it was towed away, so uh, that pumper needs to be replaced. And again, it was on our scheduled replacement on our recommended but not approved 
uh, capital plan. So there's people costs, equipment costs, and other related costs that we have, such as the use of the high school at the shel for the shelter, things like that. Um, the cost of the seawall, which I already mentioned, uh, a little over 40000 So my, uh, my, the information I put in the packet to you Friday had a copy of a letter to DOI requesting to deficit spend. So the, what happens is when a community has a bill to pay and they don't have an appropriation for it, they have to ask the Department of Revenue to be able to expend money in excess, to pay for liabilities in excess of appropriation. If you recall, we did this last year in Rose's Lane where we discovered that it was more, we have to write to DOR and say, we know we have this liability, we understand we have to satisfy it, we will satisfy it at some point in the future, like at a future town meeting, but we need to pay these bills now. So the amount I put in your packet for Friday was, in the letter prospectively to DOR, was $400,000. I'm asking that the board approve that for $500,000 tonight. Again, I don't expect that that will be the upper limit. I expect you'll be looking at this again in two weeks as they get more bills. But um, right now, I think half a million dollars <coughs> is, is a good amount. Um, I was in touch. DOR contacted me last week. I told them I'd already sent the letter prospectively. So all we need to do tomorrow is Kim just needs to send a certified vote, you know, to them that you voted to deficit spend to pay these bills this evening. Okay. Motion. That's going to be our next agenda item, um, number seven. Yep. And then. Ah. That, that. That's so what the that's number seven says. <laughs> And then finally, the last item under storm response is National Grid. Um, I think folks in town are pretty well aware, either person from personal experience or just reading, uh, that we had some uh, significant issues with National Grid's response. Um, however, the town will have an opportunity to address those in detail because there will be a hearing. The DPU has scheduled a hearing in the Attorney General into National Grid's response. The board has, I personally received a letter from, to give to the board, which you saw from National Grid, asking to meet personally with the board to discuss emergency response uh, during the storm. And th my response was that we'd be happy to meet with them, but with everything else going on right now, we probably couldn't do that till February or March because we still are in the remediation and mitigation phase. I also want to have a fair enough opportunity for the chiefs to compile their logs and so we have enough information. We will need that for evidence at the hearing, but um, National Grid has specifically asked for a meeting with the board and, I, and that will happen at one of your meetings in February or March. Um, and that's all I had, I think, under storm update. Any Unless you have any questions. <coughs> questions at all? <coughs> Trisha, I just want to say thank you very much. For many people who don't realize, you know, she was, uh, along with Chief um, um, Judge and Chief Stewart, um, uh, dealing with this storm from Sunday afternoon on. Uh, she, uh, she traveled extensively, um, you know, a number of hours. She was in the western part of the state, came back, made sure she was here. Um, and, you know, at the time, she, I'm sure she wasn't aware of the magnitude of the storm, but she was up early uh, all night long uh, into the morning. Uh, she did a phenomenal job for this town, um, and you know I have to say I saw it firsthand. She was fielding calls. She was out in the field trying to help um, the situation, and um, for the benefit of this town. And you know we had a fire, we had the down wires, we had you know the, the storm surge, and you had you know National Grid, a, a no show. Um, she did a phenomenal job, and I just want to say thank you very much uh, because I saw it firsthand, and I have to say. Um, you're the pers perfect person for that job. You did an excellent job, and I want to thank you very much. And everybody should give her applause. Thank you. Again, thank you. Um, so, I'd like to move on to the next item. Uh, Ms. Jenkins, if you could come forward, I guess. This is why I wanted to put it into this topic, because otherwise we'd have to come back another two or four weeks to talk about it. Okay. Now we can talk about it, because it falls under the uh, umbrella of the storm. So. You have submitted to us some information. Um, yes. Um, let's take a look at this. Put together these packets on short notice just um, 
And just to go through quickly what you have, um, there's initial petition for uh, doing some work on the seawall. The photos that are there, the black and white photos um, and the colored photos are different time frames um, of that seawall between first and second cliff. Um, photos one through three show that the entire beach uh, was covered by a seawall. That the, the dates of that is 1930, late 1930s. Um, there were no houses behind that seawall. The purpose of the seawall to be put in there, it was put in there in 1911, I've been working with Dave Ball on this and Jim Bailey, was to protect Situate Harbor. Um, there were no private properties there as far as buildings. Um, it was all a mossing entity. Um, and so the next group of photos show the landward side that there, you know, and clarifies a little bit more that there were no ho houses there and just shows the Irish mossers working in the 1930s, it's got the old Coast Guard station in the back, et cetera, et cetera. Mary, rather than saying the next group of photos, could you please refer to them by number? Four through six. Thank you. Right. Uh, photos seven through 10, the colored ones, um, show the current state of the seawall after the storm. Um, there's also a newspaper article showing the construction of the seawall in 1979 and how it was done. It was a work, uh, a federal work project um, that put that seawall in after the 78 blizzard. Um, and at that point, there were houses there. They were put in after 1950. And those houses had the option of putting on a cap to that seawall, a small three foot heightened uh, portion to the seawall. Um, and they either, some chose to do it and some chose not to. So the seawall kind of has a, a grid uh, construction to it. Um, and the reason the seawall was there is really to protect Situate Harbor. It's not pr to protect these uh, homes that have since been built. Um, <coughs> what's behind the seawall with the breach that's there now, and I don't think that seawall is going to last if we have another significant storm. Um, Behind the seawall is the pump station, the maritime park, and Situate Harbor. Um, those are all in jeopardy if the seawall breaches. I think some of what I hear going on is that maybe we need to be a little more proactive in looking ahead at some of these seawall problems instead of reacting to them. This is a case where we came in and we did some work on it, but not enough. And now it's in a real state of, of, of collapse and what's behind it is town-owned property, which is the most expensive property on Edward Foster Road. Um, with all the boats on it, in 1978, there was a, a the seawall that was lower that you see in the earlier photos. The boats in the Young's boat yard lifted off their cradles and smashed into each other, and Young's had a horrible time dealing with the fallout from the boat damage um, after 78. And that's one of the reasons why the wall was rebuilt. Um, but at this point, nothing's been addressed on that. Um, and I needed to bring it to the board's attention that really what's behind this seawall is major town property. Um, and, and it's a public hazard the way it is right now. So I, um, I just wanted to bring it to the board's attention so they could consider it in their repair estimates. I know, um, if, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think that the town is actually, if Kevin, are we s we're sending an engineer out to take a look at the area in the wall? Or Al, I know you're here too. Okay, so we're, we're, as a, from our town perspective, we're trying to figure out the integrity of the wall and in the event that there is another storm, which obviously there will be another storm, and the impact and what's going to happen. And, and really then I think the next phase would be like an assessment of what's, what work needs to be done, if any. I'm not saying there's not going to be, but if what, what work needs to be done. Um, I think there's also an assessment that has to be 
how's it going to be paid and funded? My understanding is this wall is privately owned. It's, it's no. a private seawall. No. It's not. It's on private property. It's on private property, but it was paid and built for and maintained with public funds to protect Sidgwick Harbor. And um, there's a big discrepancy there. Just because it sits on, and when it went in, in the 1911, my, it was the beach was co-owned by James H. McDonald and Danny Ward, and then co-owned later by his son and uh, Fred Conroy. What they did was they said, we want to put a seawall in across this portion of the beach. And they said, fine. So never at one point was it privately funded to put that seawall in. They gave permission to put it across a private beach. And ev everywhere in Massachusetts, when you own coastal property, you own down to the mean low seawater. It's just part of Massachusetts law. Correct. So to say that something that's been funded publicly, paid for publicly, and maintained publicly is privately owned doesn't make sense to me. I, I understand that, but town council has indicated that even if the town has put the wall in, I'll take, take your word that it was done by on top public funds, that in and of itself doesn't make it town owned. So the town put a wall in in 79 or 1951 or 1930 or 1929. Now a new wall needs to be put there if that's the case. And I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the issue of who's going to pay for it is probably a bigger issue that's going to be vetted later on. I think the important thing for tonight and certainly for the short term is to figure out the integrity of the wall and determine how bad is the condition of the wall. Because my understanding is that this was not due to the, the, the condition of the wall has gotten worse since the spring. It was in a similar situation or it was <coughs> disturbed from one of the spring hurricanes or storms and now it's gotten worse. And, and like any of the walls, I mean the town and the board, if I can speak on behalf of the board, obviously we're concerned of any type of breaches, any type of impact safety issue. Um, so obviously that's why we're trying to look at all the walls, not just this wall, but all the walls. I think there's a situation in um, well, further up, I know, in Oceanside and Shore Acres, and then I think the concerns with the glades and down in mine. But my point is, is that that's number one concern that we're addressing. And if there's a problem, we have to address it, or somebody has to address it. We're going to have, a, have to have a discussion on that topic. Um, but I think the first step is to figure out what exactly is the impact right now after the storm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. John, if I could just add, <coughs> we were very much aware of the seawall condition. We had a meeting three months ago, Dave Ball came in here about a seawall down in <clears throat> by the lighthouse. So th this isn't something that we're not aware of. There's a whole survey that's been done that's ranked every wall in town from A to F. Um, the problem is, as John alluded to, is it's money. You know, we, we'd love to fix all the seawalls, but we don't have money to do it. We haven't had money to do it for uh, how long? Five, ten years? Um, have we really had put any substantial money into it? And all we've been doing is putting Band-Aids on them for um, whenever there's been a breach. Um, so I don't even know if the wall that you're talking about would even be considered near the bottom of the list of the other walls that we're talking about. So, I mean, as we learned, <coughs> I think, during this storm, it all depends on where the storm hits. You know, where's the epicenter of the storm and how is the wall at that one point? Um, we're aware of the condition of all the sea walls. We don't have the money to fix them. Um, the town doesn't have the money and it won't have the money. You know, we all are aware of the f financial situation that the town is in right now and is probably going to be in for the next several, several years. Um, the budget is not going to be able to sustain a program to fix our seawalls. I, I feel pretty confident saying that in the, in, the short, in, the, in the near future. So you've got to look at other sources of revenue to do it, and there's not many. You know, we've got... The budget is one, it isn't there. The stabilization fund is only $2 million and we're dipping into that now. And thank God we didn't use that money for some other use that people have wanted to over the years or we wouldn't be able to borrow money to do some of the projects we're doing and we wouldn't be able to fix the stuff that we have to fix right now which is in a, an emergency situation. The only other two sources of revenue are override and betterment. Um, I guess my question is, Beyond that, you're talking just the town funding. I I'm trying to look at the bigger picture here. Situate has got 17 miles of coast. No matter how you slice it, you're going to be in trouble forever with your seawalls. Yep. So is there something that can be done to go to the next level? These seawalls were all redone 
with federal work pro projects, all right? We, in this country right now, have a crisis for people looking for work. Is there some way to start a process that this can work into, instead of fixing just roads, let's go move on and start building seawalls, because it all, with, with, if I may, with the, with the assistance of our legislators, we're looking at every single possible source of money to do this. We're not saying, I mean, Tony just eloquently and John eloquently just summarized the fact that we don't have the money here. We, we're going to the state, the state's going to the feds, we're doing everything we possibly can. None of us are going to sit here right now and say, oh yeah, there's this account up at the state that is going to take care of this. You know, we'd be remiss if we, you know, re represented it that way. But we are certainly looking at this as, as a high priority and trying to find the money to do it. Are there things that citizens in the town of Situate can be doing to be more proactive, to be calling their legislators, to be writing their senators, et cetera, et cetera, to start bringing more awareness to this, this problem? I mean. Well, I don't want to speak for the, for the whole board, but my personal feeling is, is the more letters and phone calls that you make to the, to the people up there, the, the better off it's going to be. That's just my personal feeling. I mean, because the more people are aware of the dire circumstances, then the better. And I will say, as we heard earlier today, I mean, Jim Cantwell was here. We did have uh, Senator Brown here. We had Bob Hedlund here. A lot of people are aware of this. But as you know, I mean, some memories, I'm not saying this about those particular individuals, but memories are short. Come July, we're all lying around on the beaches going, hey, isn't this just wicked? Isn't this just yippee skippy? We have these great beaches and we forget all about the fact that those beaches were under 10 feet of water six months ago. So it's the sort of thing that's going to need, you know, concerted pressure and concerted information. But I also want to say those people also are very sympathetic and they understand it as well. And so we're all looking for the, we're all looking for the resources to do it. Mr. Norton, if I, I, if I, if just if I can have one sentence to what he's saying, none of them are extremely optimistic about us getting any money. Is that, a, is that an accurate statement? Yep. So we're going down those paths, but we're not um, under the impression that we're going to be getting any money from any of them. Unfortunately, in, in writing letters and, and is, are excellent, but the, we, you know, the letters you write would be to Senator Kerry, Senator Brown, Con Congressman uh, Keating. They were aware of the problem. The people we have to convince is the senators and congressmen from Missouri and from Nevada that don't live on the coast. They're the ones that are reluctant to spend any money on seawalls. And, and there's, there lies the problem. It's just, it's for us, it's a giant priority. It's, it's one of the highest priorities we're facing in town. Someone from Oklahoma doesn't see it that way. Uh, it's, it's, the way it is, so it's 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 after you're absolutely right. It's a it's an issue that has to be uh, understood to be a, a a much 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 larger issue than a break here, a breach here. Uh, we could be fixing those band aids. Well, we're here tonight trying to find solutions <clears throat> to band aid them. I guess uh, the big problem is it's it's nationwide. It's every uh, mile of coast that has seawalls is facing the same situation, if not today, next year, or five years from now. I don't know how, you, and it's a federal issue, it's the state's not gonna, you know, we're not gonna have money, as Tony said, for years. Right. The state's gonna not have money for years and years and years either. It's gonna be, have to be a federal issue. It's, it's you're gonna have to get uh, our representatives at a federal level, you know, to, to start trying, attempting to get some money for seawalls. Mr. Uh, Harris. Uh, Al or Kevin, <clears throat> when is the Seawall Committee meeting again? Do you know? The next one is probably going to be next Tuesday. And, you know, from what, you know, the audience is hearing, I mean, in all likelihood, could, shouldn't something along the line, I don't know how it would get paid for, <sighs> very similar to what you're doing on Sand Hills, to do that at the breach on um, Edward Foster Road, put the riprap in front of the wall just to, I know it's not the most attractive way to repair it, but it would hold the seawall in place, even if it just meant the large, large stones. Could the sea, would the seawall committee look at something like that? Sure. I mean, I mean, I mean, there, the, the cost implication of the much greater area that's affected. 
affected on that seawall um, where it undermined. And um, basically, what we had a small reserve of stone that we kind of had carried away. Mm. And we were going to use that stone for the last painted job that was part of our contribution. We dipped in and we used all that stone in repairing the seawall. So any additional work, we're going to have to purchase significant amounts of stone. Could we look at seeing if there's, I, and now that you mentioned that, I do recall seeing the stone, you know, some was stockpiled around 8th Avenue and then there was some along Sand Hills that you did. That's a great idea. You moved it up to the, the base of the wall. Is there any more like that where they're talking about, not in front of Edward Foster? There isn't yeah, any? We actually, on, on that wall, we had to start bringing in stone today. We brought in, I believe, between 12 and 16 pieces of uh, five ton armor stone okay. to uh, shore up that wall and that section of the wall. Because I had a conversation. An urgent problem at Peggy Beach Road, where the road is in danger of being undermined again. Where, Al, on Al that where? corner where the ice cream truck would park the on that corner? The overlook? The overlook. Right, right. This gentleman in the back. Yeah, when, when I use Ed my 14 Conroy Terrace. Now, as, far, as far as funding, would it be possible if anybody who has property along the seawall would grant a permanent easement to the town, and rather than buying up green space, out of the community preservation fund, start funding seawalls. It's been raised before. Can you fund? Uh, Mr. Chair, just as the liaison to the CPC, I believe that issue has been raised before as to whether seawalls are eligible. And well, it's protecting uh, what community funding bought in the first place, which was the boatyard. I'm well. Well, they contributed uh, certainly to the boatyard. Um, uh, I'm well aware of the arguments in favor of that. I'm not up as to whether that has been allowed. It's been recent, very recently discussed as to whether CPA can be used for seawalls. Um, can I respond to that, John? It, yeah, if you, sure, otherwise I will. <laughs> Go ahead. We met with the chairman of the Community Preservation Committee last year to ask him if it was eligible for seawalls, and he asked the state, there is some precedence for uh, repairing seawalls. They have to be on town-owned seawalls on public land, i.e. a town-owned beach that the public uses in frequent or fronts open space. We have put a request into them for how much? $400,000. $400,000 for seawall on beaches that all of the community and all of the residents of the community can enjoy. We also have requested under the recommended FY12 capital plan $500,000. It was the top recommended um, project that I recommended for Seawall um, for the capital plan for FY12. And the other thing we did is, John, and I met with Lieutenant Governor Murray two months ago and told him about the need to s many of the issues that you raised in terms of the seawalls. But in answer to your direct question, CPC money may be able to use if they approve it um, for beaches that are like mine at Peggotty Beach where the public and it's lifeguarded and there's parking and things like that. Uh, sorry, the gentleman behind Richard you. Eckhouse, oh, Richard Eckhouse, uh, 12 Meeting House Lane. Regardless of where the funds come from, the town has a responsibility uh, in the sense of maintaining the infrastructure. So that, for example, and I just throw that out hypothetically, if all the people who lived on the beach decided to abandon their property, the town couldn't just simply say, well, we're not going to fix the seawalls and the harbor will disappear and where I live will become beachfront property. It seems to me that you have to address the issue of what is the town going to do in line with what Rick said? We don't know where the reimbursement is coming from, but we do need a plan because that is our responsibility as selectmen to say this is how we're going to protect the town. That part I haven't heard. I hear what all the issues are that you have to address, but I don't think there's a long-term plan that says here's what we're going to do. Then you go on and do the next thing. How are we going to pay for that? And what is it we're going to do? Where do we? In other words, we're retreating. And the uh, ocean I, I, is dis I disagree, Mr. Eckhouse. I just told you 
We're taking a look at the wall as a result of the two recent storms from March and this one. Now the wall is somehow jogged and displaced to some degree. You're, so, you're already insinuating that the wall is breached or the wall is compromised and it's going to have a significant impact on town-owned property. That is not the case yet. Until we have our experts, hold on, I'll be right with you. Until we have our experts, engineers tell us exactly the, God bless, the extent of where we're at, there's no sense to start planning a whole bunch of plans, spending more town money, <coughs> and putting us at a disadvantage. So that's why I say to you right now, I disagree with you respectfully. Uh, if it turns out that this wall is significantly compromised, then we'll have the next step, which is, okay, what's going to be the short-term plan? And then there's going to be a long-term plan. Short-term plan would be, what do we need to do in the immediate near fu future for future storms that can come up in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, Absolutely. that's going to, like, put it, okay, keep it there safe, the way that we've done a Band-Aid down on uh, Turner Road. Then the long-term plan is, what are we going to do with a big, long wall, and how, who's going to pay for it? which is going to be hashed out, whether it's through CPC funding or whether it's going to be where that gentleman, I guess, took off, or whether it's going to be privately owned or it's going to be betterments or, you know, that's a whole separate is issue that's going to have a lot of disgruntled people, some people happy, some people not, either way. But I disagree with you. No, there is a plan, and the town has been dealing with this not just since 2007, but they've been going through this since, I think it was in 2001, through this report, going up and down the seawalls and taking a look at the seawalls, putting them into a rating system so that they could determine which wall is more important to deal with than the other. Just so happens this wall, which was rated, I guess, a B, is, is impacted. So now we have to figure out what's the nature and the extent of that impact. And I, I just reiterate, there, obviously there's a plan if it's number one on the town administrator's um, capital plan listing, and they've already spoken to CPC about getting some funding. Now, what we're talking about is this one wall is your concern today. There's two weeks ago or three months ago, it was a different wall. So I don't even know where your wall is going to rank in terms of the 50 walls that are on the list in terms of what has to be repaired. So if we do happen to get $500,000 get allocated to this, your wall may not even be in the top 10 on the list. That doesn't mean it doesn't need it. It just means there's only so many funds and so many walls to fix. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a long-term problem, and we have a plan that we're trying to fix it, but unfortunately we have to do it in small chunks. And there are five miles of wall in this town that we have to address. You know. well, I understand that. I mean, I guess I, I, my next question would Mary, be... Mary, hold on. I'm sorry, Ms. Jenkins. This gentleman, actually, if you could identify yourself, you have uh, Yeah, up. my name is Jim Carey, and uh, I live with my wife, Mary Ellen, at 138 Edward Foster Road, which is basically where this wall is. And, um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I can appreciate the fact that you have some issues with funding. We all do. Um, but I'm hearing this discussion about rating the wall and how, how bad it is and how, how bad it may be or may not be. And, but as you know, I received this letter from the DPW yesterday in the mail, and if I may. Uh, it says the DPW Engineering Department has determined that there has been damage to the seawall owned by you and other abutters to your property that must be addressed immediately. As such, I am directed to contract for repairs to shore up the wall so that the inland property and public safety are not endangered by any breach. Uh, I, I, frankly, I, I was stunned by this letter. You know. Yeah, it, it, this, this has to be done by Tuesday, January 4th, which is today, and I received this letter yesterday, and I'm hearing that you haven't really decided how bad the wall is. There's going to be an engineer out. Or I, w I was out today, apparently. Is that, is that what I heard? Yes. And you're waiting for a report, but but you, you want me to fix the wall today? It, it, does that sound a bit unreasonable to you folks? As you know, I did respond to email to all of you. Hopefully, you, you did yeah, receive it and, and read it. And, and uh, uh, if you want to comment on that, fine. If not, we can meet later. What do you mean, meet later? Uh, it, it, meet on site to okay. talk about okay. the email okay. or? No, I just I mean, want to be clear. That, I just want to be clear what we're talking about like here. Okay. No, no, okay. I think the, um, you know, obviously in light of what's transpired last week with the storm on, on Turner Road and Oceanside, there was a breach. So it was significant to get to address this issue immediately. Um, and I think obviously with the situation here, I mean, I don't know the, the, the degree or the depth of how significant it is. Obviously, for everybody in this room, I am assuming everybody's here for this hearing or for not this hearing, but for this issue. It's a significant issue to everybody in the neighborhood. So if there is, 
it has to be addressed. It's got to be dealt with. Now, we as a town are, I guess, presently um, evaluating it. And then d did you say that there's some things put out on it? Or has anybody, did I hear that? Uh, nothing's been put out there right now, right? But no, no, nothing. There's no wa work right now. We haven't done any work on the wall. So we got to address the issue. Um, outside of that, I mean, my understanding from town council is the wall's owned by the owners, whether the town actually went out and put it up there in the past or got it funds to do it, it's owned by those people who actually, th that it, the, the wall rests on your land. So it's, it's your I wall. May. I mean, that's certainly his, his latest opinion on the matter, mm -hmm. so, which is very different from what it's been up until this storm. And as you know from my email, you have responded and, and done work arguably effectively or ineffectively or cause, arguably cause more issues because of the work that town has done out there. So. And, you and, and, and simply put, you know, if, if this is my opinion, if the town went out and, and somebody's private property did something, that person got a benefit by it. That doesn't obligate the town to continue to mandate that to, or duty to continue to maintain it, to repair it, to fix it, unless there's some agreement, some either easement or some kind of uh, a legal obligation for the town to continue to maintain it. Um, since that's being said, my, my thought is, and I, I can see why town council said this, you know, you, at some point in time, the chain of custody of the title, because you recently, have, I don't know how long you've owned the property, but in 1979, the wall was put up and benefited those people who live there, some of which live here now. Um, since then, that's a benefit they got. Benefit the town got. But, but also the actual the property town, owner got a benefit by it, too. that harbor. I understand that, but I'm the saying at this point. The benefit the town got five years ago when it seriously breached and the private property next to mine and the mm -hmm. town came out and spent a week out there, 24 hours a day, preparing it so that the harbor wouldn't be lost. And I hate to say this, the the harbor. it's a different and economic time. Community. It's a different well, economic time that we're looking at. Because, you know, I mean, let's put the, you know. We're all let's, looking let's, at Let's, it. let's look at us. it. Uh, yeah. yeah, we've also got other issues. We've got a, pu a pumper that now is down, that we need to buy one, okay? That's gonna be, what do we do? Fix the wall, get a pumper. We've got issues with um, fire and police so do we fire a whole bunch of people on the town side so that we can put wall up there, which means we're going to have inadequate maybe police or fire? Do we fire more teachers because we have a huge budget deficit with the school budget so we can fix the wall? Do we decide to fix this wall because the other wall down on, on, on Lighthouse Point, which is clearly in a significant breach, have, you know, it's a mess, we're going to fix this wall over that one? That wall is a public wall owned by the town, put in by the town owned on the land, okay, but this one isn't. I mean, these are the issues that we're facing, and I, I just want everybody to understand that, you know, this is your neighborhood. We fully understand that. We know that there's a marine center behind there. We know there are public boats behind there that are going to benefit people during the summer who can put their boats there, who can use the center, but a lot of people in town can't, and there are priorities that we're all facing. You folks don't get the phone calls at night about the kids and the teachers and the fact that the classroom sizes are being impacted. I mean, we do. So we're here sitting up here trying to figure <coughs> out the priorities. We've got a small budget. You know, our town administrator is trying to figure out what are we going to pay, what are we going to continue to cut to address these issues. We're well aware of this. And it, as, as Tony and Sean and, and, and Joe, we all, are, and Sean um, and Rick, sorry, Rick, where do we do? We've got so much pie, but we have so many people to deal with. You've got a situation that we have to assess. We're going to have to figure it out, and it's going to be a long-term situation and solution that we're going to try to work together on it. But in the meantime, something's got to be fixed. If the storm this weekend breaches it further, okay, it's going to be a bigger mess. It's going to impact all of you. And then, then we're going to be back here in two more weeks saying, what are we going to do there? Maybe you go higher on the list. But what happens if we decide to fix yours, and then we have a breach down in Lighthouse Point? You folks aren't going to be sitting here. We're going to have everybody down in Cedar Point sitting here saying, why did you fix that wall and not, and not fix our wall? We came in a year ago. I mean, I, I fully understand, Mr. Kerry, what you're saying here. Um, but the realities are here. Well, I'm happy to hear that, that, that you're going to assess the situation and that we can work together on this, as opposed to, frankly, this threatening, demanding letter that says, if I don't fix it by today, you're going to fix it and bill me for it. That, that's... That's not how you work together. I really okay. Uh, well, if I if I may, um, I think John just said a really important points there, and I think you're saying important points as well. And I'm not going to speak to the particular wording of the letter or any of that sort of thing. But the point point remains about this particular wall. 
and you say, well, it's town council's current opinion and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's a private wall. And so okay. right now, and, you know, I'm not going to argue legalese with you, and you're not going to argue but with me. But it's not me. just because you say it is. I, no, I understand that. Just okay. because just because you say something enough doesn't necessarily right. make it true. Exactly. I'm, 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 well, I'm in academia. I understand all of that. Okay. okay? But, you know, the, the point of the matter here is, is we're all doing what we can. Okay? The letter made it very, very clear it's a private wall. That's fundamentally the bottom line I infer about the content of that letter. How we deal with it as a town without, and I say that as a town with a small T, and I don't mean with a capital T in terms of any financial outlay coming from the town for this particular wall, is going to be subject to the discussions that Mr. Danny, he just articulated, and everybody else here in this room is articulating. We're all on the same side, and none of us have any money. None. And you can start talking large-scale national politics as to where the money is going, you know, politically, geopolitically, you can start talking large-scale national initiatives, as Mr. Norton was talking about, how the senators from Missouri are really arguing about where's the money going to be for their levees, which are also flooding a lot in the Mississippi River and flooding things out left and right, okay? So versus other large-scale initiatives, speaking as a marine scientist, there's a lot of discussion going on at all about whether we, nationally we should not be doing any seawalls. Because you can actually look at, there's a remarkable correlation that the more seawalls you build, the less beaches you have. And Peggotty Beach and this beach in particular had enhanced erosion once the, once the cliffs themselves were armored. And the cliffs themselves were armored out of all good intentions for protecting those homeowners up there long before any of this came up. And what that started doing, ended up doing was deflecting the energy more towards the barrier beaches that are interspersed between them. There's large scale and there's a healthy uh, scientific literature on maybe we should get rid of all the groins on all the beaches and maybe we should get rid of all the seawalls. It might be. So we're not going to solve that, just like we're not going to solve the geopolitical issues, but we're doing the best we can with zero money, essentially, to, uh, to answer the here and the now. This gentleman, and then I'll come back to you. He had his hand up first. property in fact runs out to the low watermark, does that mean that everybody that owns out to the low watermark owns that wall? I'm not asking for the answer now. Just yes, I'll give it to you. No, the answer is yes. I mean, you owe to the, if you own and your property can deeds, those, then you own to the, the, to the wall. Can those homeowners keep people off that wall, which we allow people to go on the walls, we meaning the town? Number two, how can the town require somebody to make a repair on their own property? Which, which I guess I personally take an offense, even though it wasn't my property, that the town says, I don't care if the town says we're not going to pay for it. I mean, I care if it's, if there's no money. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out where are we going to spend the money, where are we going to get it. But telling an individual they have a day or seven days, depending on how you read that letter, that you've got to get it repaired. And if you don't repair it, we're going to fix it because it's in the public interest. Well, if it's in the public interest, well, then it's not private property. It's public property. You've basically taken, taken the property. The first issue, I, I would say that, you know, you, you talk about if your deeds, and this goes into your deeds. You read your deeds, that tells you what you own. Meets and bounds, the whole nine yards. And as far as the law goes, my understanding is if you own on the, if it's not owned by the town, the beach area, you own to the low water mark. People can tra traverse over it, providing certain conditions, fishing and everything else. And, a fishing uh, pole or, or something, right. Yeah, for fouling or whatever. It's kind of interesting, archaic. But um, the other issue is the, um, the walls. If it's, if it's a private wall, the wall's on private property. It's not town-owned. So, you know, that's, that's a whole separate trespass issue. Um, with respect to the uh, issue of the letter, okay, I, I, I could concede after reading the letter and looking at it, there probably uh, <coughs> could have been better worded. But the long and short of it is I don't want to make this hearing, or not this hearing, this meeting over the issue of the letter. Neither this is about I. the wall, and this is about what's the long, the big short-term picture and what's the long-term picture. So um, I, I will concede that, uh, okay? You couldn't get the wall fixed in one day. If you did, then maybe we should hire you to fix all the other walls in town. <laughs> all right. It's good, because I need a job. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this gentleman here, please. I'm Barry Reynolds. I live at 132 Edward Foster Road. This is my neighbor. I must be one of the abutters, referred to in the letter. I, my question is very simple. It's the following question here. Is it the t I understand the town has financial problems. Is it the town intention to basically uh, assess the homeowners for t repairs to the walls in front of their homes when they're breached in order to maintain the public good? Is that how we're going to solve this funding problem? Because that's how it sounds to me based upon this letter. That, that's certainly one of the it's options. An option. It's an option. So, so if that's indeed the case, are you actually going to tell the town, the property owners, how the walls must be repaired and maintained? Something the town has been less than wonderful up to until uh, now? That's all up for discussion. Okay. So I mean, seriously, happens. anything, if, if, if I may, anything is, is on the table. We're welcome to any ideas. I mean, as Mr. Danny, he said, there's betterments, there's overrides, there's all these other of things, and then there's all sorts of, you know, engineering-related discussions that we're not going to be able to answer here and now. But this speaks sort of somewhat to Mr. Eck, uh, to Dick's point and some you of our other finish. points about okay. uh, it's the decorum. other okay. people's points about needing a long-term plan, a long-term strategy to how to deal with this. I had, as, as Joe North knows, I talked to Joe on the phone yesterday. I contacted Jim Cantwell. I contacted John Kerry's office. I contacted uh, Scott Brown's office. A number of people I've called and talked to. That, based on all these conversations yesterday, yesterday I actually started looking into whether I should look at contracting to repair the wall. Uh -huh. Until Jim sent me a copy of this letter, and I stopped. Right. Okay. So if your intention was to get me to act, I'm not actually going to receive this letter, but I'm assuming I bought a letter. And all I did was cause me to stop. So I sit there and said, how can I win in this situation? Okay, the town's going to tell me what to do to repair a wall that they say they don't own. So it's really a follow-on question. I think that gentleman who's happy he articulated it for me because he's not involved. But that's a very good question. I think a lot of property owners along the coast are going to be asking themselves if this is indeed how the town intends to deal with this issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm working to try to get, and I understand the same conversations you've had with these people, they've said the exact same thing about federal and state funds. So I, we had the same conversation with these folks. Jim Cantwell, wonderful guy, working really hard. Um, worked hard, I think, in the Marshfield wall, Sea Wall issue last year, if I understood what he was saying correctly. But he says it's very, very difficult right now getting any kind of funds for state sea walls. So I appreciate that. But I also think you guys should appreciate that, you know, if it is our property, then <coughs> someone needs to step back here. Uh, you know, I'll address that, and maybe I'm, I'm speak for myself, okay? If it's a privately owned wall, which I understand, it's your wall. You do so at your own peril. If you decide not to do anything with the wall, then that's the risk you run. And, you know, I think, you know, you've certainly convinced me that if it's a private wall, you know, the town, you know, is not necessarily in a position to say, fix the wall to these specifications. It's up to you to decide how you want to do it. I think the town is, and, and, and this is not an issue I've looked into, but if it comes into a situation where the town determines that there is something that's going to jeopardize the town um, facilities, for lack of a better word, utilities, okay, then the town could come in and say, under uh, emergency, we're going to go in and do something. But at this point, I'll be candid with you, if you decide not to do anything with your wall, then I th you do so at your own peril. I, I just think that that's the reality of it. You, I mean, um, and I'm not trying to be... Kurt, but I mean, if, you're, if the expectation is to wait long term to try to get funds from the federal government or the state government, I think you're going to be waiting a long time. Um, if you think that, you know, we're going to try to figure out from the town perspective, you know, I'll be a, a realist here. I, I'd be willing to people in the West End are going to say, I don't want to be putting money on seawalls for people who live on the water because I live in the West End and it creates a whole host of issues and the balancing of all these other priorities that they say we'd rather have land in the West End or we'd rather have. Um, something else over here, you know, or, or, or I'll take people down in my uh, Hummer Rock. You know, they want roads in their area. They're not going to want to be spending tax dollars to help the seawall up in that area when they're looking to improve the roads down in Hummer Rock. So, I, I mean, you know, that's, that's what we all are confronted with. Because you know what? We might be able to get an article on the town meeting to fix the seawall, but then you're going to have to deal with the vote to get it passed, whether it's a debt exclusion. Or you decide that may fail, and you say, guess what? Then we should do a betterment. Then you have to decide, how do you set up a betterment? 
Are you going to do it for just the people who own on the seawall? Do you begin to say, let's expand it to the people in the flood zone? Do you begin to say, well, that would exclude maybe the people who actually live on first and second cliff because they're out of the flood zone, but they're protected by the seawall because that's the only means of egress or ingress from the road. So then you have to include them. It's going to be it's going to be a real long discussion that's going to be very hard, and, and that's why I say they're going to be happy people and people are not happy. And I don't know the answer to it. But are we prepared to deal with it? Yes. Are we prepared to go forward with it? It's going to take – that's why we have the Seawall Committee as a result of um, the, the, the situation on um, Lighthouse Road, you know, to try to figure out what's the priorities. Now we're going to have to reshift the priorities <coughs> and then try to say what's going to be – how are we going to fund this? I, I, I don't have the answer. But what I do have is that obviously we have to figure out long-term solution in, in the event that there's an emergency, a short-term solution to fix that, to work into the long-term. As a homeowner, for me, as long as the economic decision is made binding for protection of my property, I'm happy with that. Okay. That's fair. No, I, I, feel <laughs> I may end up deciding I'd rather just put my house up on pilings. Right. Let it go underneath. Right. Actually, it I'm would be. <laughs> <laughs> no, just one thing that un people understand, that's one of the, th the damages, a lot of the damage that we had was extensive, but there was some damage that we didn't have because people since 1991 have gone through FEMA and put them on stilts, you know, and so there would have been a lot more damage to homes in this storm had there been, had they not raised them, you know. Did you have one, Sean? I saw that. Well, I was just going to make a comment. There was some discussion about, you know, fixing your wall, the wall yourself. Well, it, you know, a little play comes into codes, building codes and so forth. If, if your deck comes off your house in one of these storms, you're not going to just tell a homeowner, repair it yourself. I mean, there, there are codes. So if someone does plan on fixing a seawall or a section somehow, you know, they'd, you know, they'd have to check with Neil or Al or, or all of all the above to, to do something like that. So it's I just want to throw that out there. That's just all. a few more questions because we're hitting 830 and I want to move on to our next agenda item. Um, uh, I did have somebody else here, did, did I not? Okay. Yes. Your address? Your address? 15, Captain Daniel Litchfield. I'm actually in the West End. I'm okay. As far as there you go. possibly can get. But I'm <laughs> involved in this town. I've been involved in a lot of seawall issues on the Conservation Commission. And to throw a curveball in it, if it's extremely expensive for the gentleman to fix the wall that's in front of his house, he has the option of removing that wall if he chooses to. He's actually been elevated. And if it's only for his particular property, he's safe anyways. So the difference between a private seawall and a public seawall, I would just caution the board that you really should be looking at the damage that's going to be caused by the particular breach in any seawall that's in town and how it affects all the surrounding properties, not right. just one individual right. piece of property. If he didn't put the wall back, the first cliff could become an island, but his house will still be there maybe. So I would just caution you that the private public, you know, the problem is still the same. So it's, it's getting the seawall fixed, whether it's private or public, I think take that out of the equation and, and look at the damage. Thank you. This lady over here. Like yourself, I don't mean to be flippant. Name and address. That's all part of the equation that we're considering as we weigh our options. It doesn't sound like you are. Well, we certainly are. Oh, believe me. We certainly you know, are. I mean, yeah. We certainly are. No, we understand. No, no, we, we completely understand. The we completely who, understand. It's, and it's actually, it's not a flipping question. It's a well-phrased question. The people who are here on, on Cedar Point were saying if there's a breach between the road, how are we going to get people from Jericho Road over to Lighthouse Road? Well, we have investments. <coughs> but we have. Right. Well, that's one of the major properties in, you know, if, if something was done in that area, the town would be a big part of it because they have a major piece of property in there. And that benefits the whole town. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we are considering that. There's no solution, but obviously it needs to be discussed. Just like John said, it needs to be discussed over on all the other areas of town as well. 
All right. Any other questions? Any other new questions? This gentleman in the back, and you got the last question. Ken Loring, Edward Foster Road. I would just ask, um, is on this temporary uh, inspection, you've already obviously done an inspection on the <coughs> temporary repair that you did. Is there, has there been an, an inspection on this one? It seems to me that a stitch in time might save nine. The wall's completely, the, the material on this ocean side of the wall is completely gone while the land side of the wall is there 10 or 15 feet high. One more storm, that whole thing's going to go out to sea, and it's not like dump it a little over. bit. I Just invite you to go look at it, but don't walk near it because it's this close to going south. Now, your engineer should be able to tell you that better than I, but it seems to me that some riprap or some action before it happens would be a lot cheaper than later. I would just encourage you to have an engineer consider a temporary fix like you did down on the lighthouse. Uh, Riprap is there 50 feet away from where this is about to collapse. It was put in the last go round. Uh, if you look at in, in front of uh, um, O'Donoghue's house. Not yes, it is. It's Hold on. Okay, hold on. Maybe hold it's on. 100 feet, whatever. No, no. But the, the land that's in front with the riprap is owned by the town. It's not owned by O'Donohue. So O'Donohue owns the property in front of the wall or where the, where the wall is. But the land directly on the beach is town-owned property. Having said that, what, and I'm not trying to be short, the, okay. we, we, we had an engineer f uh, look at the wall today okay. to try to give us an assessment as to the extent of it. That's, I'm sorry, I, I may not have made that clear earlier. So I'm, we are, because we want to make sure What's you what we have there? The temporary fixes in order. Are you prepared to do that, or is it going to go to? Well, that's really. I'm just looking for. A yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to have to. If, it, if 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 they come back and say we're going to have to fix it, th if something's got to be done. Then we got to look at figuring out how we're going to do that. But the bigger question is, at the end of the day, is who's going to pay for it? Well, I, I, hear, I hear that same question about the temporary repair you already did. So I don't know where. But that's town-owned wall. That won't. Well, the wall's well, own. Yes, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. In other words, that wall's owned by the town, and the beach is owned by the town. The difficulty here is it's not owned by the town. If the town, if everybody here sitting here who has property on, uh, on Edward Foster would be willing to say, guess what, I'll deed out the beach, we'll have a public beach, you want to put a new public wall, make it a town-owned wall, that might be a solution in the long term. We could say, great, but that means you're going to have people using the beach, and the town wall would be the town wall. I, I'll tell you right now, I would think that would be a great solution, win-win all the way around. Everybody in the town would have to pay for the wall, and then everybody would have access to the beach. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great idea. Unfortunately, you still don't have any money, so I, I think... Well, I, I think you'd, you could sell more people in town in the West End to say, you know what, if I'm going to get a public benefit out of it to help rights, they might say, you know, it might be a winner, considering that we also have a public $7 million facil facility across the road that could uh, augment the walkway, the boating, the beach, it's not a, not a bad solution. But I guess the question for all the owners are, would they be willing to deed indefinitely easements? But I, can't answer, I, can't speak I know. That. All right, folks, I do need to move on. Um, what we'll do is we'll have an assessment. We'll have a, a report. Um, obviously, it's, it's a public record. It's going to be open to, uh, uh, to the public. We'll, we'll get that in a matter of, I presume, a week or so. Kevin, I'm not sure what the deadline is. All right. And we'll, we'll address the issue from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. One follow-up. Can the homeowners that are affected, the abutters, expect a different kind of letter now? Uh, you know, I've, I, I'm, I'm moving on. Let's, let's move on. I've told you let's, let's move off the letter. The issue is the wall and what we're going to do long term, okay? All right. Thank you, folks. Let's move on to the next agenda item, which happens to be agenda item number seven. Motion. I just I need to read it so I can do it. John, you have to vote the deficit yeah. spending. Number seven, you want to do that? That's number seven. That's what I was just going to do. I'll just let everybody uh, clear out. Kim, Kim, do we need to insert a figure in that motion, or is that motion good? We don't have to. Five hundred. We need to insert that figure in the motion. Okay, um, this is a discussion vote payment for liabilities incurred in excess of appropriation under Mass General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 31 for the December 26th and 27th storm. And um, I think 
Would you we like need a we need a motion. Motion. Move the Board of Selectmen approve the incurrence of a $500,000 liability in excess of appropriation as permitted by Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 44, Section 31, and with the approval of the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. Do we, uh, uh, is that's a motion by Mr. Murray, seconded by Mr. Harris, discussion. Tricia, do we need to uh, have a, an amount, or is that motion in and of itself? Oh, you did. I didn't hear. Okay. I just Sorry. put the word 500,000. Yep. 500, That's all I want to hear. Good. Right before the word liability. Any other discussion? Any questions from the audience? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. All right. Moving on to agenda item number uh, eight, which is a discussion of the fiscal year 2012 budgets. And in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, 220, which is the fire budget. Chief Judge is here. Chief, if you come up again. And um, oh, that's not. Put it back Hang on one second. This is 220. Chief, what I've been trying to do, I, we did it last year. If you could just quickly read the uh, mission statement. Very helpful. Well, before I start, I want you guys to remember all the nice things just said about the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> the Situate Fire Department is committed to providing the citizens and visitors, and visitors of Situate an effective, well-trained team of professionals to protect their lives and property through fire protection and education, emergency medical and rescue services, fire suppression, and emergency management. And um, obviously, there have been some goals that you've looked at and some objectives. Are there any that you'd like to highlight for this past year, Rick? Uh, for the past year or for the upcoming goals? Um, for the past year. Past year. Um, and then I was going to ask you, what are some goals for the upcoming year? Okay. And then we'll get to the budget. Um, I know this is actually, you know, uh, no, we didn't get to suffer a serious injury all year. That's. Uh, that was, that's a really good thing. That's uh, our, our main goal right. you know, every year. So um, and we did, uh, actually, the good thing is uh, working with the uh, water department. This communication now that wasn't there in the past, like they're doing these water main projects and they're communicating us with, you know, would you like a hydrant in a different area or replace older hydrants? So, you know, there, uh, there is a commitment now to upgrading the, uh, the hydrant system, which is, long overdue. John? When we were down on 7th Avenue, that was... That, well, how old is that hydrant on right. uh, with 7th Avenue? It was like 90 years old, wasn't yeah. it? And it, wor and it worked okay. It what, it, Chief, could you just mention, you know, something like that, a fire breaks out, and they go to a 90-year-old hydrant, and I asked a question, but I want you to repeat it for everyone watching, you know, what would the rod going down to the valve snap? And yet, then yet your next hiring could be how many feet away, how much right. time? Well, hopefully there's one not too far away. But uh, actually, we did have that issue um, the past three years. The um, two two uh, structure fires, the, the the closest hydrant, it broke. You know, so it really slows down your operation. You have to break everything down and bring it. You know, go to the next hydrant. And um, time is of the essence in a fire. Just the you know, the the um, the time of fire spread. You know, five minutes is difference between saving a house and losing yeah. a house. Sean? So is, is part of the flushing program? I mean, you, so you're, oh, yeah, when the, you're the flushing, flush. so you're really, when you flush, a high, you're testing it as right, well. Right, right, you're testing okay. it. And um, in the past, the water department, they would test the same hydrants every year for their fire flows. Well, because, you know, it's, it was more convenient. The water's not going out in the street. They, they weren't going to ruin people's lawns. Right. So... So now they, you know, they're they're taking you know a little different route doing this now, and you know, and, and, it, and it is going to pay off. They're finding hydrants that are broken. They're breaking hydrants in, in a non-emergency situation as opposed to us breaking them when you know. When it counts, right? You know, in in the past, they, they you know, I volunteered to have all our guys out and you know test the hydrants, but um, you know, they they after the first day when uh, like 12 of them were broken, you know, so we we can't afford this. And I said, well, look at the hydrant system. If then, you know, right. if they're not going to work when you need them. But um, like I said, we, we are working hand in hand with, with the water department. And um, like I said, there's a lot of 90 year old hydrants out there. Right. So. Chief, can I ask one quick question on, <clears throat> on one of your goals? What is a personal accountability system? Oh, that, that's um, on the fire scene. 
Excuse me? It's not a fire scene. It's it's our way of just keeping track of all our personnel. Okay. On the, so it's know. actually at a, at a fire. Really, yeah, okay. at, a, at a scene of fire. And, um, you know, we really don't have an official one. We kind of have a, you know, an unofficial how, how we do things. We're a smaller department. It's just basically like bigger departments. If you have like a huge building, you know, you want to be able to count. Just say if you have a collapse, you know, one section of the building, so you, you'll know who is over there, how many people, Thank who you're going to be looking for. And, um, you know, so some, you know, they have very elaborate systems with ID cards with barcodes on them, with your name, medical, you know, say if you go to like a major event with uh, a lot of mutual aid, you get all different groups. No, it's just easier for the incident commander to keep track of all the personnel on scene. Okay. Just uh, the other thing I noticed <coughs> is that you had the um, the ambulance was one of the uh, accomplishments, adding a second ambulance, obviously. Um, yes, we, we've been running that. Um, actually, I haven't looked at it since like the first two months, but we, you know, it, it was doing very well. We, uh, you know, it was. It's, it's generating money, money, but it's the reality is we're also having two ambulances right, for right, a town right. of 18,000 people, and which 20 minutes ride, that's a huge benefit for right, the people right. in town. The, the citizens are getting a lot better service. Yeah. So instead of sitting there, you, know, you wait for Cohasset and all right. ambulances to show up. Right. So you know, they're getting a quicker response, and, uh, and I'm sure our paramedics are a lot better than the ones in Cohasset and all so Absolutely. They're getting much better service. <laughs> Rick? <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, Chief, a couple questions for you. Under the FYI 12 risks and challenges. Number one, you talk about how the department is short two positions and to maintain a minimum of 10 firefighters per shift is draining the overtime budget. And um, without getting into too much detail, I am curious though, where does that number 10 come from? I.e. You, you feel you need to maintain a minimum of 10 firefighters per shift. Is that some is that just a historical average? Is that a, a no, national actually, standard? No, actually, we've been now. We, we were at 14, you know, years back. But that's we had another station when the minor station was yeah. open. Yeah. We we had 14 people, and you know, slowly we were close the station. And then we, you know, the, the different uh, hard times we cut yeah. back. But 10, I, I really 10 is the minimum you can you can run the Central Fire Department at the level that we're doing now. Right. Like we we can like handle two calls at the same time. Yep. And we wouldn't really be able to do that. It, yep. you know, we'd go any less than that. So, uh, how so much that's that? four here, four at the main, two in and Hummerock, two at Hummerock? Two in Hummerock, two next door, and six at headquarters. Six at right. Well, that's what the ambulance are, two ambulances, an engine, and a ladder truck, and a shift commander. I'm just asking these questions out of, na out of naivete, okay? okay? But I just feel like i got to ask them. I'm just you know, curious. They've been asked of me, and I'm also just sort of wondering. Now, we have two stations here on the main part of Situ, not Hummerock, the one down by the by uh, O'Brien's and this one right next door here. Has there been thought about combining those two stations and what would be the negative impact and the positive impact of doing that? Well, um, we're already, our response times are really not up to the NFPA standards already. Yep. No, I mean, you're supposed to have personnel there within six, within five minutes, 90% of the time into parts of mine it in the west end it's it's eight or nine minutes for, for us to get there so i mean that, that would add more time to the, definitely the west end by closing the station sure yeah but you'd still need from, from a fire standpoint you, you basically need two engines mm -hmm. to fight a fire yeah and you'd need you know you would be just running the two, two engines out of one station or are you talking about eliminating the engine and right Right, so that, that you'd be stuck with one engine up here, and no, oh, that's good. You know, the two engines is is basically the standard for, for fighting fire. No, that's very helpful. First response. I appreciate that. Um, has there been a long-term change in the sort of the ambulance to firefighters ratio beyond? I mean, I understand from the previous discussion that you just had, for example, that we've got another ambulance physically, like well, well, we've the, had the, the, the the vehicle. Right, right. Has there also been a change in the amount of firefighters that have paramedic training or? No, actually, we have, we've kind of held it. We're, I believe we're at 20, 21 now. We've been 22, 23, but we hire them. Actually, we've lost, in the past three years, we've lost five of the younger guys, the paramedics. Do yep. they, they've gone to other towns huh. because um, they pay a little more and uh, they're just not very loyal. Yeah, yeah. No, I got you. Okay. No, that's great. That's, so that's very So there's 21, helpful. just so the board chief, there's 21 
paramedics and what is the it, well, there's four shifts, of so each department? Right, there's four shifts, so there's five on three shifts and one on another shift. Out of how many firefighters? Out of, out of 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. Well, it should so be 38. there's 21 paramedics out of 40 firefighters. So in terms of staffing, he's got a challenge to yeah, run okay. those two ambulances because staff <coughs> are paramedics. Right, and when you say paramedics, you mean paramedics only. These are not the same individuals that go running into a burning building. Oh, no, they, no, no, they do that. Oh, they're they're firefighter they're paramedics. They're they're firefighter they're paramedics. Right. Right. They, they do the same as the ambulance. ambulance. Right. Yes, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah thank you. That's right. what, okay. Yep. No, I knew they were cross-trained, but uh, gotcha. All right. Huh. All right, well, let's get to that's the up. budget. All right. Let's take a look at that's that. Um, thanks, Rick. <coughs> Can I ask one quick question? Excuse me. Yes, Do you need the, these pictures look authentic? Do you need them back? He's got the bigger ones, the, the bigger oh, pictures of those. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Kim, do you have a set of this? I don't. Oh, you got one. Right. You can have mine. So, I think Joe was a water. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go there. Um, as compared to um, uh, the, the um, appropriations for this year for FY11 um, and the amount that you're requesting, you're requesting um, more, but uh, there seems to be a discrepancy with the town administrator's um, recommendation. Am I correct? It looks like you're, you're requesting this last year was for four million four thousand, if I'm reading that right. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year uh, you're requesting um, four million thirteen thousand, and town administrators recommending three million nine hundred and ninety three thousand, give or take. Um, what are the differences, just so that people understand, Rick? Do you know? Um. Well, it looks like repair went down 8000 and that must be that. Is that the money that's going to that other account, Tricia? Repair? No, that's uh, another um, commendation to the chief. He has a firefighter that's a mechanic. Okay. And he's been able, well, I can let you answer about how you've been able to reduce that right, cost. Right. Well, as we're taking the money from, the problem with the mechanic is I have to pay him in overtime and we've had all this money in to repair the trucks that we were paying to outside agencies mm -hmm. to repair our trucks. So I just had to move the money from that into our personnel so I could, I could pay him you know, oh, I see. over to you. So that's I mean, basically the money just moved. It didn't. So other salaries went up 15 and that's what that is? Right, right. That, that is the, the money to pay the mechanic. All right, let me just, while Tony mentioned that, he's an individual who I happen to know just a credit to his department. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, sit lifelong situate resident, just wonderful one. Eric Norwood, I want to say his name. Great, great individual. They all are, but he's And it looks like equipment parts went down $15,000. 15, yeah. Right, that's where we took the money out. We took it, the 15 out of that and put it into the personnel okay. side. And so overall, the town administrator's suggesting an $11,000 decrease in right. your budget from the prior year. So essentially flat on a $4 million yeah, budget. It, it's basically flat. Yeah. Questions from the board? Mm -hmm. Just nice one job. quick question. I mean, we just went through really the most active time you've probably had in a while. What did you find that you needed? You know, were there any items budget-wise that you really felt you were shorthanded to deal with this catastrophe? Well, actually, the, um, did you have enough people? Yeah, we, we did a call back and we, we, we got, well, there's never enough people in that situation. That, right. you know, when the high tide hits, all of a sudden you get 60 phone calls, I need to get evacuated. And you know, yeah. it's, you know, take a number. Right. Well, we'll, we only we'll have get so many you, front end loaders. You know, is your house yeah. on fire? Yeah. You know, is right. you smell gas? You know, right. you could be a priority, but you know, they right. just, you know, we just went down the line. The, um, what, uh, the, the suits they were wearing in the water, we only had four of them. Actually, we just found out like the day after that we received the grant from uh, FEMA to, to be able to purchase 10 of them. Right. So that way there we could have everybody on duty would have one of those suits and, and it would save a now lot of Now why don't you explain, I don't know if everybody knows, but two of your firefighters actually walked carrying a hose yeah, over well, the head. we had four of them. They took six, turns, right. And six they feet would, of they, water. Yeah, chest deep water right. to, to be able to reach the fire because uh, the road was... The road was gone and... Uh, 
You're not driving the truck down there, and you can't do it on a boat because as soon as you open the line, you're just going to push the boat <laughs> away. Right, right. So, no, I, I'm, I mean, th those guys did a great job, but everybody that night. I think it was more the, uh, the getting the people out of the house that's during the height of the tide and the wind and the snow and everything yeah, else. Yeah. I, that, that was, they, they did an outstanding job. But, you know, I mean, th they're all very well trained, and they know their job, and they're very willing to do it. And, and actually, they are a credit to the town. Absolutely. The only other thing I'd add is I know that you need some equipment. I know in the capital plan there's a, a couple of things that. So yeah. is that is that really the the course of your department's needs right now, or more capital needs as opposed to right. budgetary needs? Yes, capital. Well, actually, I could. Um, <laughs> you don't have to go through your list. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well you asked. No, I, mean, no, no. I, no, I just well, Presto, I, I uh, like I said, we are down three positions now and actually I just found out that one of our members is leaving in February so we're going to be down four problem with when you hire a, a new personnel they you, you know you bring them in you start training them and you send them to the academy for around three months then you put them in the the ambulance till you're, you're confident that they can do their job without you know hurting somebody or, uh, opening yourself up to liability so Sometimes it takes like nine months b before you can really use these people as, count them as one of the 10. Yep. Yeah, and I don't have the money really to be able to send this person away for, for nine months or, or not have them for nine months and, and pay them <laughs> in replacing the, the open spot with overtime. You know, so I mean, at some point, you know, it, it's gonna give. And uh, like this year, it's gonna be real close overtime wise. So hopefully uh, we're looking into, there's an over, uh, a layoff list. There's still some people on it. There's a few paramedics on it. These people have already been through, through the academy. They're trained. If I could get them, I could plug them right in. And it wouldn't, you know, it would save the, the town like $50,000 of training and in time. You know, so we could plug them right in to uh, shift strength. So, but that's I suggest right. you do that. And I want to clarify <laughs> that's an interesting point. that too. Those Thanks. two unfunded, unfilled he had were cut in the FY11 budget, and it's unlikely they'll come back. The vacancy he has now and the one he anticipates will be filled. Yeah. So I just want to be clear on that, that um, we don't want him down four, but as he just said, there's a long rope lead time before they're actually a contributing member of the department. Sean? With a ready to go P paramedic, right? That's what. Oh, that's yeah. all you hire nowadays. Yeah. Right, right, right. 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 Yeah. Firefighters yeah. are dinosaurs. Well, Chief, thank you. All right, no other thank questions. You. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Right. Uh, moving on to the next um, budget is uh, the police. Chief Stewart, if you could come up, please. Swap seats there. Um, And if you could also, uh, would you be so kind to read the uh, state statement that you have? Okay. The mission of the Situate Police Department is to carry out patrol, investigative, enforcement, support, and educational functions in order to promote the safety and general welfare of the citizens of the town of Situate. And if you wouldn't be, uh, if you could also just highlight some of the goals that you had. Um, reached or goals that you had and goals I know the ones that you had listed and that you're looking to accomplish and this the ones is from you did the prior right uh, we're still working on some of these but uh, one of the uh, goals was to upgrade our uh, policies and procedures which we've, we've been able to do quite a few of those uh, we did a, a har harassment protection racial and gender profiling we uh, we now have a uh, <coughs> Memorandum of Understanding and Mutual Aid Agreement with the uh, Air Force down at Fourth Cliff. We've implemented a low jack safety net uh, policy. We've actually trained a couple of people in that. Um, eyewitness identification, <coughs> safe keep, emergency dispensing, uh, interrogation interview, motor vehicle inventory, protected custody, use of force, vehicle pursuit, um, piping plover, spit, We've upgraded our domestic violence uh, policy and procedure. Beach sticker, beach lot, uh, juvenile lockup, uh, sheriff's department matron, property and evidence handling, and, and 
quite a few others that we're working on. Uh, <coughs> these are all available to the officers via uh, our IMC records uh, management system. Uh, um, a number of the officers have been working with, uh, you know, they work as, as a matter of course with uh, various departments, boards, town departments, boards, committees, uh, and citizens to address uh, uh, many of these are traffic uh, uh, issues. We received an $8,500 traffic enforcement grant. Um, Officer Thompson has attended a, an advanced uh, motor vehicle crash reconstruction training uh, classes. Um, we've uh, worked with the town administrator to uh, with the uh, event application process. It was something that we'd never <coughs> had before with, uh, you know, for uh, events that, that take place on uh, you know, public property in, in uh, public ways. We worked uh, with the beach sticker and waterfront zone, uh, the beach sticker committee, safe routes to school. Uh, we regularly attend the safety, uh, school safety and security meetings. Again, the low jack safety net. Uh, we did quite a bit of work with the uh, Wampatuck School with regard to traffic patterns, uh, and especially with the construction around there. And uh, obviously the traffic and safety at events like uh, Heritage Days and Duathlon, St. Patrick's Parade in uh, July uh, 3rd and 4th. Uh, one of our uh, objectives and goals was to, to uh, uh, improve the uh, the situation out, out at the new inlet in the spit, I think we accomplished uh, that. There's more to be done, but uh, we were presence out there, and I've, I've got some feedback from uh, from uh, all the people that go out there, and they seem to think it was a better uh, year out there. We uh, we met initially with the, all the agencies and organizations that might be involved out there, not only in law enforcement, but uh, Audubon, conservation, um, and I think it was a better year out there. Um, as far as the grants, we've uh, obtained a uh, $35,115 911 support grant, uh, a $6,288 uh, $6 911 training grant. We received a, uh, um, a, a grant from, a, a donation from Rotary to DARE, uh, and also from the Copeland Family Foundation, which is out of Milton. An $8,500 traffic enforcement grant and uh, what's called a COPS grant, which is a, a Department of Justice. It's, it's a federal grant. We've applied, our status is on file. Uh, it, would, it would actually fund another position. We, we may at some point in time uh, get it. Uh, as far as the uh, last goal was to work uh, to uh, uh, inv investigate the uh, situation with regard to uh, a uh, combined or a regional 911 dispatch uh, that's in progress. We've attended the meetings and it's a, it's, it's a work in progress right now. So. Questions from the board on any of the goals and objectives? I'm busy. Um, turning to the budget. Um, for this fiscal year, you're looking for um, 3 million two hundred and. Fifty-eight thousand. Um, the the discrepancy from the town administrator is about um, um, twenty-six thousand dollars. It looks like she said, she said three million two hundred thirty-two thousand. Um, of those items, that some of them are here. I, it looks like fuel and lubricant lubricants. There's a discrepancy there for about two thousand. Um, another thousand for uh, medical supplies, um, clothing. Um, mileage reimbursement. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's an awful lot of discrepancy between you and the No, actually there's a 2,000 in seasonal salaries. We may be able to pick up some of that through the uh, beach sticker uh, uh, revenue because uh, th that does uh, fund. Actually, we have a, s a summer uh, officer that does nothing but uh, parking and the waterfront zones, the, the beach uh, lots, so we may be able to. <coughs> And um, outside, I had a question for you with just the vehicles. 
um, somebody had asked me, I know this is kind of off topic, but the cars, it, do they always, are they supposed to be left running constantly? Is there an ability to There's, turn, uh, them off, turn them on? I mean, I just. For the most part, okay. Uh, there's a, the tremendous amount of electronic equipment. I mean, we got computers, we got uh, radios, uh, and uh, a lot of times it just seems if you don't keep that car running, to particularly if you're out in an accident scene or something like that, just to drive everything that's uh, that's we have to operate off of it, the, the emergency lighting. And uh, I know in my own case, uh, if I take the car home for the weekend and, and um, you know I leave my car and I don't use it for the weekend uh, and I forget to turn something off I've always got to jump the thing when I get it. so it, it's um, yeah I know it seems you know you always see that everything is left uh, th we do have uh, uh, a mechanism on it to keep somebody from jumping in <coughs> and taking off with it uh, <laughs> Chief, could you talk? Uh, I missed this early. Could you talk about the uh, the vehicles during the storm and what you've done to sort of safeguard against future problems? Right. We've, uh, as everyone knows, we've you know we've gone through this before. And uh, what we usually try to do, all, all the vehicles, uh, my own and, and all the others, were, with the exception of maybe one or two, were exposed to the salt water and. and uh, and what we do is, uh, I had a, actually had a uh, company, we've used them before, they come in and they power wash the entire car. They, uh, uh, underneath the engine compartment, they uh, paste up the electrical connections with, uh, grease up the electrical connections, the battery connections. And actually, I, I'm in the process of running all the cars through the, uh, down to O'Brien's, just to have them look them over. Uh, in lots of situations, you, you've got to change fluid, you've got to change transmission fluid. Um, it's an expense, but it's, it's going to prevent, I think, a, uh, a greater expense further down the road. Um, you know, sometimes it'll be six months from now, and, and within a, a matter of a few weeks, all the alternators will go on the cars. Uh, so we're trying to do the best we can to prevent that. Sean? You run up hours and miles quick enough that the bodies aren't going to rot out. So right, you're it, it, turning them over uh, quicker. But you'd be amazed at what uh, damage took out of these cars today. I mean, just stuff that uh, sand and seaweed and life and everything. It just, uh, you know, you, we, we have a policy we try to stay. And if it's something, it obviously it can be done with a, but um, you know, it's just, it, you just have to operate and, and you're gonna be in areas that are, that are exposed to salt water. Uh, we've had pretty good luck uh, doing what we've done in the bigger storms and, and handling it this way. And then hopefully this will work out the same. Rick. Um, Chief, on this side, uh, Looks like an Excel spreadsheet on the back of your departmental accomplishments before we get into the formal budget sheet here. You've got your description of revenue, FY09, FY10, FY11. Right. And there's something called insurance restitution LDI. And I'm only drawn to that because in fiscal year 10, that was about $29,000 of revenue that came in. And there's a not applicable in 09 and not applicable in FY11. We didn't so, have but I'm it. curious is where is that money going to be coming from? This year coming up, if your budget is still even going up, I'm just, well, we didn't that's have a tough we one. didn't have the policy. I don't believe in FY09. We did. You have to understand <coughs> that in '11, uh, you know, we're still. Uh, what it is, it's a policy that uh, the town actually collects on if we have somebody that's out uh, injured. Ah, gotcha. Okay. All right. Which I, I actually have one officer I'll need yep. to have now. Collect something on that. Yeah. And then the only other question I had was when there's the last override, I believe the, the, on the town side there was a traffic enforcement officer. So how's that working out? The, excellent. Uh, we still have the traffic, the traffic enforcement officer is assigned to that. We lost the position. Mm -hmm. I, I actually have two vacant positions now, which are funded in this yep. budget. But, uh, 
it's uh, as it was when we had it before. It's one of the best things we ever did. Uh, you'd be amazed at how it, it, it uh, you know, the officer goes out, he addresses complaints, citizen complaints. We send him to places where we uh, know there's a problem. He's actually our rep on the uh, Traffic Rules and Regulations Committee. Yep. And right now, whenever he's working, he handles, uh, he was the officer that we sent to, a, it's a very uh, advanced and sophisticated uh, accident reconstruction uh, mm -hmm. uh, course. Uh, was actually uh, in three sessions, three, it was a three week, uh, which they broke up, but he's actually qualified to, to uh, investigate a, a fatal accident or any type of a, sure. a motor vehicle accident. In what he, uh, what, when he is working, uh, he handles all the accidents that, that occur on his shifts. So uh, sure. it's worked out really well. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Any Chair. Any other questions? No. Chief, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Are you here for the animal control or? I, if you have any questions, uh, um, let's turn to that one. Well, I, I just want to ask the same question I asked the fire chief. In terms of the the thing that we just went through, the, the experience, did you find anything that was clearly missing from what you're? No, I mean we uh, we started out we had a limited number of people. Uh, I actually tried to get one more person in to, to start out with. We uh, we're actually during the course of the night we were able to get people in. Uh, we had a lot of because it's you know in the holidays we had a lot of people uh, on vacation. We actually had some people. Way, but uh, when we needed them, uh, people answered the call. And, and, uh, right. No, uh, you know we're going to have some. Uh, you know while our, our costs, obviously the vehicles, we lost a little bit of equipment. I think we may have lost. We may have dunked a couple of radios. Um, the cars, it remains to be seen. Uh, and, and you know some clothing and, and some stuff that got torn up and whatever. But but you have 40 officers, or 40, not officers, 31 officers it looks like, and six dispatchers. No, we're actually funded for 30. 30? Um, currently we have 28, and we actually have two out. One's out on, a, uh, on an injury and one is out on FMLA. Uh, so we actually are operating right now with uh, 30, include myself, so we're, we're operating with uh, 26 right now. 26. And then five more in the summer. Mm -hmm. So we that's enough to handle. We do have three uh, permanent intermittent officers that are permanent part time that can come in any time during the year and work shifts uh, for us if, if necessary. So he's understaffed, and that's why those funded positions are still there. But until we settle the police contract, I don't want to bring somebody on board from a financial perspective till we have the full impact of the budget. But once you get these vacancies filled, you think that this is an adequate amount to no, run? No, I do not. You don't? No, I do not. I think this police department is understaffed. There, there is no formula as such, but there's kind of a rule of thumb that, that uh, you, you want uh, um, you want two officers for every thousand uh, in population that you, you have, you know, so that would put us up. 36? 36, 38, somewhere up in there. And his benchmarking shows that they're understaffed. We, we actually had, uh, in the early 80s, we had 40 officers. And, uh, 30. Sean? He answered the question about the PIs. Yep. All right. Um, Brian, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Animal control. I. I think that was level funded, right? Level funded. It's, it's, it, it really includes a, it's just uh, the animal control officer's salary, and we actually, in our budget, we uh, pick up the cost of some things at the uh, shelter in exchange for uh, the services that they provide us. It could amount to as much as $6,900, but I don't think it will. I think it's less than that. Thank I you. Gonna just, uh, we, we, uh, no, that just on the animal control, we, we got a memo, I believe, recently, uh, accomplishments 2010, and it was just you know, eye-opening to some of us, uh, just how much the animal control officer does as far as uh, animals, herd animals, picking up animals, abandoned animals, rapid, you know, squirrels and stuff like that. And uh, 
I think it was very, very eye-opening. A lot of work's done there, and it's a uh, between that, her and the and the animal shelter, you know, it's it's something the town can be really proud of. Yeah, they're very very proactive. In turn, I just learned it when we opened the shelter. It's actually one of the few animal friendly shelters that yep. we have. Yep. So uh, Trisha was mentioning to me that a lot of people won't leave their house if they can't bring their dog with them. Yep. And in our situation, you can. And the chief cordoned off an area for the for the pets, and it was. Uh, um, you know, big benefit for the town. Yep. Yep. I'll also say I adopted two cats from the animal shelter, and I had to go through a more rigorous security check than I had for that than I had to for several jobs I've had in my life. Most people don't have to go through that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it looks like they know where I was <laughs> coming from. <laughs> Good. Uh, moving on to agenda item number nine, which is the annual license renewals. Motion. Uh -huh. Motion. Please. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the Common Vic license for Ronnie Jones. General store for 2011. Second. Seconded by Mr. Vignani. Discussion seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Will the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the Common Vic and Hawker Peddler's license for the Hammerheads Grill? Second. Seconded by Mr. Murray. Discussion seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Third. Uh, move the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the Hawker's Peddler's license for Roman McCall. Second. 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 Just a quick question. By Mr. Murray. Discussion. Wh who is Roman McCall? Is that is that a? Does anyone know what that is? It's one of the hawker peddlers uh, at the North Situate um, spot. At the okay. And it's a renewal. Yes. Other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Finally, move the board of selectmen vote to renew the Class Two license for Situate Shell Inc. Second. Seconded by Mr. Vignani. Discussion. Question. Sir. Yes, Mr. Murray. Uh, I recall when we. When we allowed this, and, and I think they're doing a good job and so on, but we put in some uh, conditions as to numbers of vehicles and, and where they would be, if I recall, and because uh, we wanted to make sure that it didn't get too large in terms of a used car lot and everything. And I'm all in favor of renewing this, but I, I think it would be just nice to have that those guidelines or those conditions rechecked. I'm not begrudging the business whatsoever and I don't want to stop this but I just think it might be worth since this is the first year the end of the first year of that that it might be worth a check up at some point actually I'm glad you raised that because um, I noticed that they're parking a, a, a car for sale in the handicaps parking spot they can't do that so I don't know I, I, what's the process that we do do we send them a letter telling them not to do it and that um, that they should be parking a car for sale in the handicap spot I'm looking at you, Kim, for an answer. Well, I don't know. Uh, on their, their personal property? Yeah, and uh, at the Shell, they have a handicap parking space that's okay. it's supposed to be designated for handicap parking, and they have a car for sale. It's been sitting in there for the past two, three, four months. Okay, I so didn't I, I'm, that. Yes, and I was just thinking. That's Neil. That's Neil. Okay, yeah. so then we should probably do something to that effect. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 And that concludes the annual renewal. Um, agenda item number 10, other business? Anybody? No. Nope. Murray? I'm, I just want to repeat what I said earlier for those that may have missed the beginning, that there are opportunities for you to donate to, to some of the, the people that have been put out by the storm. So please contact, um, I know Jenkins School has um, a drive going on. I know a dance carousel down on the harbor has a collection facility for clothes, gift cards, um, and I know people are looking for places to stay for a short period of time. So if, if there's anything you can do, it would be very helpful. And then the chief mentioned that there will be a fundraiser on the 15th, a comedy show. Did he say where it was? Barker uh, Tavern. Bar at the Barker, Barker Tavern. So um, we welcome you to, to go there as well. Good. Thank you. Mr. Norton. I'll say thank you. I'll say the same, so I have no other business. Um, 11, correspondence. Is there any correspondence? No. Uh, yes, there is. Oh, I take that back. Yes, there is. If the clerk would be so kind. Yes. Um, this is a letter. This is an email uh, from the Animal uh, Control Officer Kim Stewart to the town administrator. Um, I know you're receiving numerous emails and phone calls praising the efforts of many town departments who are going above and beyond this week. I just want to also express my gratitude. As you know, many folks are reluctant to leave their homes without their pets. Um, as with this particular storm, there's often no time to argue with someone who is unwilling to leave unless their pet is accompanied with them. 
I commend both uh, Situate Fire and Police Department for allowing these folks to take their pets during a time of otherwise filled with loss. The images of fire and police personnel carrying animals through the floodwaters is both heartwarming and a true testament to the overwhelming commitment our town public safety workers have to this community. Thanks to Kathy Judge, Alana Chevray, for assisting with folks at the high school shelter who came in with their pets. Um, through coordinated efforts, we were both able to accommodate their needs. We also thank the Situate Animal Shelter for being available to us for housing pets and needs at the shelter. We are still receiving calls from folks who need help, and the shelter and its volunteers are available to help for whatever and whenever they need it. I am proud to live in the community and work beside such caring and dedicated individuals. Thank you for your time, Kim Stewart. Uh, I think, is that it? Minutes? Yep. Minutes. Right. If we could move to uh, next agenda item number 12, minutes. Move the Board of Select and vote to accept the minutes of December 27, 2010. Second. Seconded by Mr. Vignani. All in favor? Aye. 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 Please care of that. And the final one is adjournment. Move the Board of Select and vote to adjourn the meeting at some time with glare on it. All right. Hold on for one second. Actually, neither Mr. Murray nor Mr. Murray. No, I was okay, there. So second. I, I second. December 27th. I was okay. there. Yeah, this was the FEMA. This is the emergency meeting. That's right. It was the emergency oh. meeting. That's right. Thank you. So, so that's um, seconded by Mr. Norton. How about that? There we are. And okay, so I'll move to adjourn at 9.15. Now I need a second. Mr. Second. There you go. All, right. All in favor, aye. Thank you, aye. folks. We'll see you in two weeks. Have a good night.